the wisdom that is from above the theme of this third study because there is a wisdom that we need to appreciate and it's a wisdom in relation to the things we speak about so this evening's session is going to be very practical and, and i believe very penetrating study because all of us have a tongue and all of us speak and sometimes it's in wisdom and sometimes it's in foolishness James has already raised the point about speaking, hasn't he? He's already spoken about this subject in chapter 1 and verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, that every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Verse 26, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, that man's religion is vain. And chapter 2 and verse 12, so speak ye and so do, as though it should be judged by the law of liberty. So he, he's building up to this crescendo in relation to the tongue. It, it starts off in chapter 3 and verse 1 about a desire by many of the brethren to become masters. Uh, and as we have there on the screen, that word masters really means teachers or instructors. When you think about the first century ecclesia, you have, I guess, in the Jewish religion, the, the only people who could teach were those who were rabbis, who were formally schooled in rabbinic teaching. Now, once the truth came upon the scene, all of that went away. And there's a very great need for just ordinary brethren who, who probably never spoken before or who, who never went certainly to any rabbinical school to become instructors and teachers. Uh, as Paul said, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, but he said, lamentably, not many fathers. So th there's a great rush, if you like, of many brethren to actually take up this gap of instruction. Uh, we do know that uh, there were spirit filled leaders. But there are also many who also sought to be instructors. And James says, don't rush in. Don't be hasty. And the reason is, is that there is a great responsibility on those who lead the ecclesia by speaking and by teaching. They will receive the greater condemnation. And, and it's, it's a law, isn't it? A, a law imposed by God that to whom much is given, much is required. Uh, the leaders who are elected by the ecclesias to, to uh, help run the ecclesia, they will receive the greater condemnation because much more has been given to them. And uh, tragically, the, the early Jewish brethren who came into the truth, as Paul points out in Romans, were woefully inconsistent. You know, he, he uh, rebukes these brethren when he says, you know, you that teach don't commit adultery. Do you? Do you commit adultery? Uh, you that teach you mustn't lie. Do you tell lies? So, so, so in all of this rush to become an instructor and to use the tongue in speaking and educating, there was a great deficiency. And James says, look, don't, don't rush in because it's a huge responsibility. And I think, brethren and sisters, it, it's true today, isn't it, that those people who leave from the platform have a great responsibility to speak the truth, the oracles of wisdom, to unpack the word of God, to encourage it to build, is a huge responsibility. And brethren, we should never take that lightly. It is a, a huge responsibility to be able to lead people in worship and to expound and instruct from the word of God. And what's interesting is, is that James says, in many things, we offend all. Now, he includes himself in that. Uh, the, the ESV says we all stumble in many ways. Uh, James was humble enough to recognize that, that he often tripped up as well. We all stumble in many ways. No one gets it right. And then he hones in on education and instruction by the tongue. If any man offend not in word, and that word offend means to cause to stumble. There's only one person who never caused anyone to stumble, and that was Jesus Christ. In Isaiah 50, verse 4, which we have there on the screen, 
he was one who could speak a word in season. He had this capacity to speak gracious words. Uh, he knew when to rebuke. He knew how to rebuke. He also knew when to teach, when to exhort, when to comfort and strengthen. And uh, that perfection is, is indeed marvellous to behold. If you can do that, says James, if you can educate and speak <clears throat> without causing people to stumble, then you have reached this completion or maturity. And now we've come across this idea previously in James, haven't we? That patience have its perfect work, maybe perfect and complete. And this is what he's trying to do, to, to try and get the Ecclesia to mature into this perfect man. And if you can do that, then you'll also be able to bridle the whole body. It's in fact the same word he used in chapter 1 and verse 26, wasn't it? Bridleth not his tongue. I want you to notice that the tongue controls the whole body. Now he made that point in verse 2, he makes it in verse 3, and he makes it in verse 6. This member that we have controls everything we do. And, and that's the point he wants to make. It has repercussions outside of the tongue, outside of the mouth. Now, it's come, it's come to Matthew chapter 6. This, this is where James actually got the teaching from in Matthew chapter 6. Came from the Lord himself. Verse 22 of Matthew 6. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. If thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that's in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? What the Lord was saying is, is that the, the eye is, is, is the only organ that, that allows light into the body. It, the eye becomes a symbol of the understanding. And if your understanding is single, and you allow the light of the truth to come in, it will affect the whole body. Your brain, your understanding affects the whole body, and so it is spiritually. If your understanding is dark and there's no light, it still affects the whole body. And it's the same with the tongue. Our whole life, our whole demeanor is controlled by this particular member. So it's a significant thing that James is talking about. And teachers and educators use the tongue to do that. Don't rush in, says James. Don't rush in, because to whom much is given, much is required. Let's come back to James chapter 3. So he's going to give some illustrations from, from nature itself. Speaking is fruit. Speaking controls the actions of the body. It, it, it's almost uh, an aspect of of the result of faith or faithlessness. I mean, for example, at the end of verse 16, where there's envy and confusion and, and, and uh, an evil tongue, it causes every evil work. So, so faith has a fruit and faithlessness has a fruit. And a faithful tongue has a fruit and a faithless and evil tongue also has a fruit. That's where James is heading to in this particular chapter. So the first illustration is the bits in the horse's mouth. Behold, verse three, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn about their whole body. Come to Psalm 32. This perhaps is where James is drawing this image from. Psalm 32. Now, Psalm 32 is a psalm about justification forgiveness of sins and what is interesting is is that in verse 3 describing David as he sinned in the matter of Bathsheba David kept silence about his transgression now that's the wrong use of the tongue what he should have done was confessed but he couldn't he kept silence then in verse 8 the psalmist says, 
I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. So, so here is a teacher who is about to instruct them. And here's the instruction, verse 9. Be ye not as the horse or as the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near unto thee. And there's that image that James draws. So the bit in the mouth is a symbol of the mind being controlled. Okay. Don't be like a horse which has no understanding. That bit which controls the mouth, which controls the whole horse, is a symbol of the control of the mind through the tongue. You see, because the tongue is an expression of thought. The tongue is an expression of the mind. And David says, don't be like a horse with no understanding. Now, the other use of this idea of a bit and bridle actually is in Titus chapter one. Let's come across there, shall we? Just a few books before James, Titus chapter one. Titus faced this problem in Crete, Titus chapter one and verse 10. For well, there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, which is the Jewish party. So here we have an ecclesia, an island of ecclesias, where there are many unruly and vain talkers. They just couldn't keep their mouth shut. And, and, and when they spoke, it, it was vanity and deception and unruliness. You mentioned having an ecclesia environment like that. So in verse 11, Paul says, whose mouths must be stopped. And the Greek word is muzzled. They need the bit and the bridle of the truth to control their unruly speaking. So, so, so James is aware of those symbols, isn't he? Titus came after James, as far as chronology is concerned. But, but the image is there. The whole body needs to be controlled by the tongue. Let's go back to James chapter 3. Well, in verse 4, he, he turns his direction from the horse to the ship. And uh, I've got there on the screen the ESV. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, the King James has fierce winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. And you've probably seen enormous ships with a, a rudder that's a fraction of the size, but that controls so much, so much. Now, the image is powerful because you see that word will, whithersoever the governor listeth, that word listeth in the authorised version, is the emphasis that James is making. And, and the word listeth or, or the word will has the idea of caprice or choice. And that's how the tongue often works it's driven by fierce passions and impulsive thoughts like those fierce winds that's our problem when we get worked up when we get provoked from a situation where we're being challenged and threatened the tongue is going to lash out and it will be at the will of the pilot they're like a choice and that choice often is detrimental and the fierce winds and the fierce passions that can easily be aroused direct the whole body. So it, it really is a challenge when we think about the damage that the tongue can do. And I'm sure we're, we're all aware of that. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Well, they're the examples. Pharaoh in Egypt. I will pursue, I will overtake, I will satisfy my lust upon them as he charged against the Israelites hemmed in by the Red Sea. Rab Shaker, you only have to listen to Rab Shaker's speech to see the boasting this person gave. Nebuchadnezzar, is not this great Babylon that I have built? And that is the tongue. It's an expression of pride and evil. And as James says in verse, th uh, verse 5, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And that word matter is the word forest. Uh, in my margin here, I have wood. It takes years and years and years for forests to grow. 
And uh, here in Australia, we are absolutely aware of the damage of forest fires, wildfires that are out of control, stoked by winds, enormous damage. And that's what the tongue is capable of. Now, we, we all know that. But when we're in the heat of a situation, it's very rarely that we bring these points to bear. We know the damage our tongue can cause. We know hurtful words and harmful words, the enormous impact that that, that has. And yet often we forget the nature of this chapter and the example this chapter leaves. How great a forest, a tiny, tiny spark kindleth. We can say something, we can do it overtly or inadvertently, and it will set off a train and a chain reaction that has disastrous consequences to the extent that we will destroy people's lives. It, it's just a really, really sobering thought. Because the tongue is a fire. It is a fire. And a fire often out of control. Let's go to Proverbs 26. Just want to see the emphasis that the Proverbs has in relation to the fiery tongue. Proverbs 26 and verse 18. As a madman who casteth firebrands, so you see the, the margin there, flames or sparks, arrows and death, so is the man that deceiveth his neighbour and saith, am not I in sport? So, so here's an individual who delights to goad another brother and sister. And really what he's doing is, is he's pouring fire upon this very, very sensitive situation. And then when he gets a reaction, ah, oh, just joking. Oh, yeah, can you take a joke? And that I am sport, but the damage has been done. Verse 20, where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. So, so, so there we have wood and fire. There we have tail bearer and strife. A and this individual loves to stir. This individual likes to put the cat among the pigeons. Now, this kind of person really delights in telling tales, speaking behind people's back, stabbing people, accusing people falsely. That's a fire to wood. Verse 21, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. So here's this tongue of fire again. And it's a contentious man, always arguing always constantly debating, always criticizing. And the proverb said, it's, it's just like a man who's trying to kindle a fire. Verse 22, the words of a tail bearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly, burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shirt covered with silver dross. Tongue and heart together, burning lips, wicked heart. And the damage that we can do by our words is enormous. And I think, brothers and sisters, we all have been in that situation, haven't we? Where we said things that we don't mean, but the damage has been done. And sometimes we do say things we mean, and we create enormous damage. The tongue is a fire that needs to be controlled and brought into subjection. Let's come back to James chapter 3. More than that, it's a world of iniquity. The Greek is a world of unrighteousness. Because the tongue is an expression of the mind and, and the mind naturally is carnal, then it's going to express itself in worldliness. I mean, you only have to listen to some of the conversations at work or the conversations outside the meeting to see what the general kind of conversation is all about. And it's all about the world. It's, it's what interests them in the world. And the world we know is enmity against God. 
all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, all of that, brethren and sisters, is expressed in the tongue in a natural perspective. And that's why we need to control the mind, which controls the tongue. And here we have this expression again. It defiles the whole body. What we speak and think determines our actions. It's, it's really a very sobering chapter when we think about that. And says the record, it sets on fire the course of nature. Now that word course is the Greek word wheel. And the word nature is the Greek word for birth or for generations. So, so James now is, is, is moved from the horse to the ship to the forest fire. And now he looks at the way this fire starts and, and he likens it to a wheel. Now you mentioned you're at the top of the hill and you've got a wheel there and you let the wheel go and the wheel is going to move down the hill. And as it moves down the hill, it picks up speed, picks up momentum and destroys everything in its path. And this wheel is an expression, this tongue is an expression of one's natural birth. And it continues to the next generation and the next generation. You know, as, as a classic example, you, you take, for example, the Palestinian people who have an inbred hatred of Israel. They will teach their children to hate Israel. And their children will teach their children to hate Israel. And generation after generation will have the same message, unless that's broken by an external thought or an external force. Christ, of course, will eventually break that. But, but that's, that's the idea of the tongue, that, that it, it just gathers momentum until finally it's out of control. And its attitude is passed on, <coughs> excuse me, from generation to generation. It, it is an awful thing to behold. And the origin of this fire is Gehenna. It's set on fire of hell. It's the Greek word Gehenna. And I'm sure we all appreciate that Gehenna is the rubbish dump outside Jerusalem, full of rotting carcasses and evil that was set on fire to keep the disease down. That's our tongue. Comes from the rubbish dump of the carnal mind, and it sits on fire and destroys everything in its path. You know, it, it is a very compelling picture isn't it and if only we could remember some of those things when we're in the heat of conversation now now james says in verse seven and eight again once more with nature that really man can control everything most animals can be tamed even the worst animals can be tamed but in verse eight the tongue can no man there's the emphasis no natural man can tame it, it takes a spiritual brother and a spiritual sister to be able to even come close to taming the tongue but james's assessment is it's almost untamable it's frightening when you think about it absolutely frightening untamable because it expresses things in, in the heat of the moment that we wish we'd never said and i think all of us have experienced that. James returns back to nature. It is at the end of verse eight, <clears throat> full of deadly poison. Just keep your hand there, come across to Psalm 140. not just poison deadly poison it can burn forests and in the end it can kill and destroy like deadly poison so some 140 these are people who are in verse 2 imagine mischief in their heart so the mind is imagining evil in verse 3, they have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Adder's poison is under their lips. And if you notice the subscription or the superscription of the psalm, it's the psalm when David 
was delivered from Saul and Doeg. And it was Doeg's tongue that caused enormous amount of damage. Sharpened their tongues like a serpent, adder's poison is under their lips. It's deadly, absolutely deadly. I think, brothers and sisters, all of us get the point. Now, now here's a test that we need to perhaps think practically about applying. And the test is this. Can we go for 48 hours, that's two days, without saying any unkind words about anybody or to anybody? So, 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 so just think about that. Two days, the test of the tongue. I mean, for example, if you can't go 48 hours without drinking alcohol, you are addicted to alcohol. If you can't go 48 hours without needing a cigarette, you're addicted to nicotine. And if you can't go 48 hours without saying unkind words about others, then we may have lost control of our tongue. You see, if we walked into a room and people were talking about us, we would feel very, very uncomfortable about that. And yet we are very adept at talking about other people's faults when they're not there. But God is listening to that. God is listening to that. And the words of a talebearer, as we read in the Proverbs, go deep down into the soul. There was a survey given about 10 years ago, and it was written up under the subject, The Day America Told the Truth. And it was a test of people's integrity. They polled about... 10, 15,000 people, I can't remember exactly the, the, the number, and the statistics came back this way. 91% of those surveyed lied routinely about trivial matters. 36% lied about important matters. 86% lied regularly to parents. 75% lied regularly to friends. 73% lied regularly to their siblings, and 69% lied regularly to spouses. Now, that's, that's the world out there. And when you look at those statistics, you, you understand the power of the tongue to lie. We, we, we're very adept, maybe we don't lie outright, but we're very adept to not speak the whole truth or to hide something or to give undue emphasis about things. And uh, those statistics are really an indication of the problem within society. And those things rub off on us as well. Well, what's God's view of lying? We won't turn to it, but in Proverbs chapter six, the record says this, these six things that Yahweh hate, seven are an abomination to him. Here's a couple of them. Proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. And it goes on to talk about a few others as well. So, so God feels very strongly about a lying tongue, very strongly. In fact, he uses the word abomination. And I, I think that that challenges us all, doesn't it? Because, you know, we, we, we do speak white lies at times and we justify that position. A lying tongue and a proud heart. So, look, it's at this point, I want to just draw out some practical exhortations about the wholesome use of the tongue. I mean, we've seen from James how evil it can be, the damage it can do, a deadly poison, a forest fire. But, but, but let's look at the flip side of that. And let's, let's encourage ourselves in the need to speak wholesome, healthy words. I'd like to come to Proverbs 15, and we'll spend a, a little bit of time in the Proverbs because they're full of practical wisdom. So Proverbs chapter 15. Verse 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. 
The tongue of the wise uses knowledge of the right, but the mouth of fools pours out foolishness. Soft answer turns away wrath. You know, a humble, soft answer in the heat of discussion is extremely effective. As a, a disposition that says, I'm sorry, goes a long way to quelling and quenching the fires of anger and dispute. And it does work. I remember many years ago, we, we had a, an IT project. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, one of the IT technicians made a huge mistake and didn't put a backup file. And the next morning, everything went wrong. and There was no backup to actually restore from. And the manager came in absolutely furious, absolutely furious. And the technician said, look, uh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I made an awful mistake. Um, I, I won't do that again. And you could feel the whole temperature of the room just drop. That, that, that simple apology and acknowledgement of wrong was enough to bring the temperature down. And the, the boss said, OK, all right, well, make sure you don't do it again. It really was an astounding thing to watch. And that was in a worldly environment, let alone in a spiritual environment. Calmness, softness achieves wonders in that conversation. Whilst the mouths of fool pour out foolishness, you just can't keep them quiet. And just foolishness pours out. The wise man uses knowledge of right. It's got a problem with chapter 16. Healing words. Verse 24. Pleasant words are as a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, health to the bones. Pleasant words. Well done. Great job. Congratulations. Oh, I like the point you made in the Bible class the other day. They heal. They, they are pleasant and they are wholesome and they're like sweet honeycomb. To give praise when praise is due, acknowledgement when it's needed, the gentle, helpful words, so important. Let's keep your hand in Proverbs, we'll come back to Proverbs. Come to Titus chapter two. So this is for our younger brethren. So we know Titus is also a very practical epistle, isn't it? Particularly in chapter two. And he, he turns his attention to the young brethren. Second Tim, uh, sorry, Titus chapter two, verse six. Young men, he says, likewise exhort to be sober minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity. Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is to the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. So, so here's a young brother who is sincere, he's serious, and he's a person that when he speaks, it's sound speech, it's good counsel, excellent counsel. Uh, those who are debating and disputing with him have got nothing to say to that. So, so young, young brethren, it's, uh, it's a good exhortation, isn't it? In all things, show yourself a pattern of good works. And part of that is indeed sound speech. Just lost a connection here. Wise counsel. We won't turn to this one. When Nebuchadnezzar was threatened to decapitate all the wise men of Babylon, the record says that Daniel spoke wise words to counter that. A young man in Babylon turned away the wrath of the king. Quite remarkable. Let's go to Proverbs 25. Now, now here's a proverb that the Lord himself used later on. Proverbs 25 verse 9. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself. And although that's in italics, it's the sense of the word. It didn't say, actually, debate thy cause with the neighbor next door or the brother and sister behind you. Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. This is the base of Matthew 18. 
This is the basis of a brother or sister who may be upset with what you said, comes to you and uh, seeking to make things right and to uh, repair that relationship. But the discussion is between you and him alone. Discover not a secret to another. And one of the great evils that we experience is this gossiping, is this capacity to be able to spread all of these things that are held in confidence between two people in an attempt to resolve the issue. And before you know it, the whole ecclesial world knows the issue. Debate thy cause with thy neighbour himself and discover not a secret to another. Discretion is required. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. It's very difficult, isn't it, when you're on a building site and uh, everyone's swearing left, right and centre, or you're in a factory, everyone's swearing left, right and centre, or if you're in the office and everyone's swearing left, right and centre, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, Guess what? Language and words have a use. And that use is to edify and minister grace unto the hearers. That, that, that your language and your tone and your speech is designed to develop mercy and goodness in others. And it edifies and strengthens. It's a real challenge, isn't it, in a, in a corrupt world that we live in. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. Here's a wonderful example of a, a great brother, Acts chapter 9. Saul is finding it difficult to integrate into ecclesial life. Very difficult. So in Acts chapter 9, verse 27, Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Now here's a public declaration. Barnabas means son of consolation, son of, son of exhortation, and, and his words are always conciliatory. And he was the one that brought the apostle before the arranging brethren and on behalf of Paul declared what God had done. This was the use of words to bring someone back into the ecclesial focus. We've seen Proverbs 15. Let's come to Proverbs 31. This is a, a lovely expression used of a virtuous woman. Proverbs 31 and verse 26. She does a lot of things, but in verse 26, she openeth her mouth with wisdom. So, so here's a sister who is schooled in the scriptures. And not just the knowledge of the scriptures, but the wisdom of the scriptures. She knows how to use knowledge aright. That's wisdom. Practical implementation of knowledge. And in her tongue, says verse 26, is the law of kindness now that's almost a paradox i mean there are some women who are very happy to lay down the law very happy to do that but but this sister has the law of kindness that when she speaks there's kind she's not aggressive doesn't accuse but there's kindness in those words and that goes a long way doesn't it and it's a law it becomes a habit of her and she speaks those words. It's, it's a lovely expression. The law of kindness is in her tongue. Uh, we saw this quotation the other, the other day, speaking the truth in love. It, it, it has to be in love. A final one is Colossians chapter 4 in relation to the tongue. We spoke about Isaiah 50 previously. And I think Colossians chapter 4 really puts it so expressly. Colossians 4 and verse 6. 
let your speech be always with grace. What is grace? It's undeserved favour. People may not deserve the words of kindness. They may not deserve to be treated nicely. But this speech is always with grace. You know, that's very difficult to achieve, isn't it? I mean, when we're in a conversation and, and it gets a little bit heated, we, we tend to retaliate and, and the, the temperature of the room rises dramatically. And here is a speech that, that is always, always calm and quiet, even though the person doesn't deserve it, seasoned with grace. And it's seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Salt, salt's a preservative, salt gives flavour. And the idea is, is, is that you know exactly what to say in what circumstances and how you need to say it. Boy, that's hard, isn't it? I mean, how often we come to a situation saying, well, I don't quite know what to say to this person. And yet Paul is asking us to be able to have an answer to every man. That, that, we, that we know how we can help them in the words that we use in the circumstance they find themselves. Boy, that is difficult. And that flavours and talk seasoned with salt very, very difficult to achieve. Let's come back to James, shall we, with some of those exhortations ringing in our mind. The tongue is a powerful influence for good or for ill. And, and, and James, once again, turns back to, to, to nature, and he talks about a spring, and he talks about fruit trees. It's a very simple illustration, but how powerful it is. So in verse 9, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made out of the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So Sunday morning we'll, we'll sing hymns, praise to God. We'll take the memorial emblems, which speak about the sacrifice that Christ has made on our behalf. And then once the meeting's finished, we'll bail out a brother and sister in the corner and let him have it. James says these things ought, ought, ought to be. How is it that, that out of the same mouth can come totally, totally different, different speeches, praising, thanking God, and getting stuck into your brother after the meeting? Well, that's the problem with our tongue, isn't it? Highly inconsistent, highly evil. And he said, look, it's contrary to nature. Does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So, so how is it that you can speak sweet things in one sentence and then bitter things in another sentence? That's contrary to everything in nature. And even fruit trees in verse 12. You don't have fig trees bearing olives. You don't have vines bearing figs. By their fruits, you shall know them, though. The bitter fruits or the sweet fruits. See, brothers and sisters, we, we really do have a great responsibility, don't we? Sweet water and blessing and edification and love needs to be the expression of our thoughts and in turn, our tongues. We often use the expression, think, before you speak. And I came across this uh, very witty sort of uh, uh, anagram the other day. Think before you speak. Think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Can't read my screen here. I've got some words over there. Excuse me for a minute. Oh, is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Quite a nice little setup, isn't it? Think before you speak. Let it be governed by spiritual thoughts, spiritual ideals. Let it be edifying. Let it be in love. Now, in verse 13, James is going to now come back to teachers. And he asks a very pertinent question, a question which I think really is a significant question to ask 
every one of us here. Who is a wise brother or a wise sister? Good question, isn't it? And, and secondly, not only just wisdom, but, but who has knowledge among you? Uh, by the way, wi wisdom and understanding were important parts of leadership under the law. And Deuteronomy quotation has that. But, but that's an excellent question. You know, if you were to look at your ecclesia, look at yourself. What, what defines a wise brother and sister and, and a knowledgeable brother and sister? Well, you might put up your hand and say, well, you know, they, they know their Bible backwards and they, they know all the key principles. And, and that's important. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that's not important, but, but there's something else which is required. And the answer comes back. Let him show. Now, now that word James has used previously. He's used that word before. It means to expose to the eyes. And, and what it is, is a demonstration, not from what you say, but from your manner of life. That's what determines a wise brother and a wise sister. Their manner of life. Show me thy faith without thy works. Can't. But wisdom is demonstrated through the manner of life. This is another part of being a doer of the word. Different to law. Law says, keep that command, you keep it. Keep that command, you keep it. And the intents of the heart, the walk in one's life is ignored by law. As long as you keep these precepts, you're okay. But living by faith is different. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a manner of life. That word conversation means precisely that. And it's a demonstration out of a way of life of his works. Now, not his words. They're works. This is the obedience of faith. This is an, another aspect of the subject in chapter two, how faith cooperates with works. And, and here it is. Where, where wisdom is seen in the way people live and the things that they do. And more significantly, it is imbued with a life of meekness, of wisdom. There's no fanfare. There's no puffing out one's chest. There's no look at me kind of syndrome. Here is a calm, gentle, thoughtful wisdom and there is no ego at all associated with that. It's a quiet, meek way of life. Meekness, James already spoke about meekness. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, chapter 1 and verse 21, the meekness of wisdom. I come across 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's, here's an illustration of this. This, this meekness is in receiving wisdom and also giving wisdom. Look at this, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive. So, so it's not argumentative. She's not always arguing either. But gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. So, 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 so here's a brother and sister who has received the word with meekness and their life is a life of meekness and particularly that meekness is seen when they are attempting to straighten people out <laughs> uh, here are people who oppose themselves who will call themselves self-contradictory kind of people you know their argument makes no sense they're always contradicting what uh, what you have to say and they contradict themselves and paul said well you need meekness to talk to those people if god peradventure will give them repentance i mean all you can do is present the wonder and greatness of the truth and let god work with that on their conscience and hopefully they will respond to that meekness of wisdom wow if only we could have 
that kind of quality, brothers and sisters. Let's come back to James chapter 3. Now, he's going to contrast that with verses 14 to 16, where he talks about envy, bitterness, lying, strife, confusion. And there must have been some brethren and sisters who had all of those qualities in their life. And they must have been churning backwards and forwards. It must have been an awful situation. But that's what persecution did. But when it put the pressure on and people were driven out and they were running for their lives, the real individuals, characters came to the fore. And in some cases, it was not a pretty picture. You know, we, we often, when we get a bit argumentative and we get a bit... Uh, a bit stressful we sort of say oh, well, well you know the circumstances i'm in that, that they produce that and these people certainly were full of envying and strife and james quickly says that wisdom isn't from above that wisdom is from the carnal mind it, it's it's sensual it's devilish <clears throat> it's all part of human nature we don't want anything to do with that there is no wisdom in any of that but verse 17 excuse me here's the focus we need to have the wisdom that is from above now he didn't say doctrine from above he spoke about wisdom from above <coughs> excuse me uh, what is wisdom wisdom is the practical outworking of knowledge it's a behavior and the source of that behavior is the word of God. So what is this practical outworking of knowledge? Well, it has some wonderful qualities. <clears throat> it's first pure. <coughs> so so our, our motives are pure, our demeanor is chaste. It, it's peaceable, it, it results in unity and harmony. So this particular wisdom and the outworking of that it not only has meekness, uh, there's a purity about that. And that practical outworking also results in unity and harmony. Not destroying people, not pulling people down. It is peaceable. Gentle. The same word occurs in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 7, where Paul says, I was amongst you as a mother gentle with her children. Sometimes we're not very gentle, are we? We, we? we get quite fierce sometimes in our conversations and we get quite cutting at times. Gentleness is seen by the world as a weakness. It's seen by the word of God as a strength. And it's easy to be entreated. In, in other words, this brother and this system doesn't need much persuasion to help. Well, we need someone to assist with this. Can you help? No problem. Uh, we need someone to do uh, yeah, no problem at all, love to help it's easy to be entreated you know, there's nothing worse than going up to a brother and say look do you mind doing the reading today because so and so is sick no, ask somebody else easy to be entreated doesn't need much persuasion, happy to contribute happy to get involved, happy to support that's a wonderful disposition to have, that's the wisdom from above and it has a fruitfulness about it. It's full of mercy. Uh, and we come across this word mercy before, haven't we, in, in chapter 2. Mercy rejoices against judgment. It's full of mercy. Happy to give people things which they don't deserve necessarily. Undeserved favour. Full of it. Full of good fruits. A fruitful disposition. Without partiality, it doesn't respect persons, and without hypocrisy. There's no double-mindedness in this particular individual. And you can see that James has deliberately put all these kind of words in because they have a reflection back in the earlier chapters of the epistle. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now, James didn't say the fruit of peace. He's talking about the fruit of righteousness. And righteousness is, is integrity and honesty 
and truthfulness and faithfulness. And that fruit is only successfully grown if there's an environment of peace and of harmony. It is sown in peace of them that make peace. Come across to Galatians chapter 6. It is so very, very true that we reap what we sow. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth with flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. If you are always contentious, if you are always bitter, if you're always negative, if you're always unhelpful, that will in fact germinate a kind of fruit that will be to the flesh. And you'll reap corruption. It's a simple law of nature and it's a simple spiritual law of the truth. You reap what you sow. If you have an ecclesial environment, a family environment of peace and harmony, there is opportunity for righteousness to develop. If you're always arguing and bickering and carrying on, then that wisdom comes from beneath and you'll get thorns and thistles and briars. If you want righteousness, you need an environment of peace. That's what James is saying. So all this contention, and we're going to see in our next study, God willing, that there was the enormous contention in the Ecclesia. You're always wrangling and arguing. You'll never be able to produce those fruits of righteousness. So our final thought, brothers and sisters, is on the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of the spirit. There's that quotation, Galatians chapter five, that we know so well. It's a glorious fruit, composite fruit of love, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, uh, and the law has nothing to do with that. The law limits while the spirit word allows us to flourish. And I think the final exhortation for us is, is that as we look at those qualities, do, do people see those kind of qualities in us? Uh, you know, as we walk into the ecclesial hall, do they see individuals who are loving and considerate, who are peaceful, who are very patient and long-suffering, who are gentle and good, who are full of faith, who have no ego, who, who are meek, and, and they are in control. The word temperance means self-control. Do people see those qualities in us? It all stems back to how we think and how we speak, and our wisdom is not to actually necessarily teach other people, but to demonstrate that and show that forth in a manner of life and a way of life that's consistent with things of God. May we take the lessons to heart, brothers and sisters. May we understand the, the unruly and untamable evil that we have in the tongue. And may we have the capacity to be able to use that tongue for good, to the honour and to the glory of Almighty God. Thank you.